Joe Nisira is a business columnist for the New York Times. He uh, worked for Fortune magazine, I believe, for over 10 years. And uh, as a contributing writer, he's also a staff writer for the New York Times magazine. He's co written a book with Bethany McLean. By the way, let me give you another fun fact about Joe. Joe won the Gerald Loeb Award for Excellence in Business Journalism, uh, but he's only won it three times. Uh, and uh, Bethany McLean is a writer for Vanity Fair, and she's the co-author of The Smartest Guys in the Room, The Amazing Rise and, uh, and Scandalous Fall of Enron. So you get a sense these guys know what they're talking about, and they have written the new book, All the Devils Are Here, The Hidden History of the Financial Crisis, and Joe joins us now. Joe, how are you? I'm good, but I can barely hear you. All right. Well, we're working on the rewire. <laughs> okay. So, um, Joe, first I want to ask you uh, about this. Um, you say in the book uh, that blame could be attributed to former famous CEOs, cabinet secretaries, politicians, <laughs> anonymous lenders, borrowers, analysts, Wall Street traders. Um, that's all true, but I have one main culprit, and I want to run that? that by you. Okay. And that is deregulation. Now, it, it, within deregulation, of course, is the politicians, it's the donors, etc. But uh, I think that without the deregulation of the industry, all this stuff would have never happened. Agree or disagree? Go. I uh, partially agree. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> uh, That's all right. I, you don't have to agree. <laughs> yes. You know, if you. You know what was happening. You know, the, the reason that's a, the reason that's sort of difficult to grapple with is because um, the, the regulations have been put in place in the 1930s, and they really lasted well for 40 or 50 years. And then, sort of clever, clever financial innovators started poking holes in them, and they were starting to crumble anyway. And you have something like derivatives that was compl never even thought about in the 1930s, and so they were unregulated to begin with. So. You know, you had this sort of system that was kind of falling apart at the seams, and you had to do something about it. And the problem was not what that, that, that they deregulated, the, they got rid of Glass-Steagall or anything. The problem is that they didn't create a new set of guidelines or regulations to embody this new world. And so they just thought, well, we'll just, just we'll, drop, we'll drop all our defenses and everything's going to be fine because the market's going to take care of it. And as... And as they, we learned in the 30s, and we also learned now in, in 2008, the market doesn't take care of it. Well, Joe, I, but that gets to the heart of the issue, and it's the same problem, which is that, look, you need cops uh, to you regulate do. the market. And if you, you don't, do need cops. Yeah, and, and one if of you the, don't have cops, the robbers are going to run amok. That's right. And one of, the, one of the points we make in the book is, is um, you actually, even with the deregulatory emphasis, there were actually plenty of laws on the books, honestly that could have stopped the worst of the abuses uh, that would have kept this thing, you know, from turning into what it is. I mean, you, you had to, the, the, the banking regulators had to actively avert their eyes from all kinds of sleazy practices that were taking place, both on Wall Street and on Main Street, um, that were really, you know, criminal. You know, Joe, if, when we t talk about that, though, let's go a little deeper into that. Because I say deregulation, I say, you know, taking the cops off the off of Wall Street, basically causing the problem. But actually, there's a problem before that, which is that Wall Street and multinational corporations and whoever's rich enough wound up buying our politicians so that they can say, hey, do the deregulation. For example, forget Glass-Steagall, although it's enormously important, but on uh, leverage. You know, in 2004, the SEC says we're going to basically lift the, uh, the limits on leverage, which causes tremendous problems, right, or adds to the problems. Uh, and we're not going to regulate the derivatives, et cetera, et cetera. But the right. whole reason for all of that is because the politicians started working for the bankers rather than working for the consumers. Well, that's been true for a long time, sadly, and it's true today. If you look at what's going on right now, uh, you know, the, 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 the new Republican House is going to work as hard as they possibly can to limit the effect of regulation uh, that is going to be imposed by Dodd-Frank, the new Dodd-Frank bill. So, yeah, and they're going to do it in the name of, quote, you know, burdensome regulation, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, you know, the other side has a much harder time, for some reason that I don't quite understand, kind of saying, well, you know, are you better off with a system that protects you from the kind of predatory mortgages that got so many people in trouble and have caused this foreclosure crisis, 
or you're worse off. And 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 uh, it will be sad if the the if these regulations that are being written now are minimized. Well, Joe, I got a theory on that, too. And we're talking to Joe Nasira. He's uh, co-written the book, All the Devils Are Here, The Hidden History of the Financial Crisis. My theory on that is that uh, Democrats uh, and Republicans play good cop, bad cop. So the Democrats are selected to be the good cop, where they say, oh, no, it's okay, you know, and, and we did some reform, and but in the end, it's actually the same old game. And then they got there. Well, how did Chris Dodd get there? He got there through a lot of money from the financial industry. How did Chuck Schumer get there? How did Kirsten Gillibrand get there? And how are they going to get paid off when Chris Dodd and, and Evan Bayh, uh, you know, retire as they are do, as they're doing now? They're going to get huge lobbyist money from the same industry. So I think that the whole system has been corrupted by this money. What do you think about that? Well, you know, the system has been corrupted by money in more than just the financial industry. I mean, it is hard to disagree with your premise. Um, Money is po- has always been the poison of of democratic politics, um, and uh, you know that's not about to change. And 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 what is really shameful is that you can go through a crisis like the we went through in 2008, and here we are two years later, and you know our our democratically elected politicians are acting as if nothing bad ever happened. And the truth is, the banks are still in a pretty precarious position. Um, uh, you know, the derivatives are still largely hidden from view. Uh, Europe is collapsing, even as we speak, uh, in a contagion that could well hit us. And, 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 and two plus years later, we are no better prepared for another trauma than we were then. So, Joe, you know, after the shock of 2008, I was, we were, of course, on the air at the time, and I came out and I said, look, the real robbery begins now. Okay, if you thought it was, how, it was bad how much we got ripped off by the banks before, wait till you get a load of it starting from now. And I think that I was proven largely right about that. I mean, now we're finding out the Fed gave, you know, $3.3 trillion in loans to these guys, some at comically low rates of 0.0078%. It went to German banks, it went to Swiss banks, and, and, so, and then they didn't lend it out. And a lot of them went and bought treasury securities, which was basically a pass to print money. No, uh, it was, it was they, they were basically given free profits, there's no question. When you, when you, when you read that there, are, there have been entire quarters where Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan doesn't lose money in a single day for the entire quarter, you know that somebody is handing them a gift. Yeah, so, you know, and that's why we focus on the corruption of the system. So, but I want to ask you questions related to that. So, this financial reform that the, uh, the Obama administration loves to call historic, are you buying it, or do you think it had almost no effect? Uh, I, I, first of all, I'm not, as, I'm not as out there as you are in terms of saying it will have no effect at all. But I, I like to compare it to what happened in the 1930s. In the 1930s, they had hearings that were so incendiary and that got people so mad at the banks that Congress actually voted to break the banks up. I mean, that's what they did. They forced them to separate their investment banking side from their commercial banking side, right? That's what Glass-Steagall was. They created the SEC, which, is a, which was for a very long time a very potent and important agency that protected investors. I mean, those were radical steps. They also uh, uh, guaranteed uh, uh, federally insured, they federally insured a bank deposit so there wouldn't be bank runs again. So there's three steps that were more radical by far than anything that's happened this time around. So, you know, will these things, you know, help on the margins? I think they will. I think the Consumer Protection Bureau, if it ever gets off the ground, could actually be a big deal. But, but you can't compare any of the things that happened in Dodd-Frank, any of the measures in Dodd-Frank to the to the truly um, momentous things that they did in the 1930s. Yeah, you know, look, we didn't have these huge busts for 50 years in this country, the huge bank busts, right? That's right. And, and the, that's the, amazing, right? Right. It, it, it is. It, it, the regulations that came into place in the 1930s were, new, were, were astoundingly effective because, they, you know, we really didn't have another crack in the system for 50 years. And, and that, you can't expect a regulation to last more than that. Because eventually the markets kind of overtake it and innovation overtakes it and clever people figure out ways around it, right? Uh, but, but 
this time around, it, uh, you know, we'll be lucky if we get 10 years, honestly. Yeah, oh, no, no, there's no way it's going to go to 10 years, but that's going to go to my next question. By the way, and we know what to do right and what to do wrong, because we did things right in the past, and we've done things wrong in the past. Th these are obvious, and then you look at other countries. Sweden and Japan are two great examples. Sweden says, all right, we've got a clean house on these banks. They recover a lot quicker. Japan says, no, let's prop them up, and it takes them over a decade, and we're still they're not sure still, if they recover. Right, they're still, they're still not recovered. And, and the great fear in our country is that we have... Uh, we're looking the other way, uh, hoping, the, hoping the economy will recover enough to help the banks heal and kind of averting our eyes to the bad loans that are still on the bank's books. That's, that's, that's the big, big fear uh, that, 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 you know, the other shoe hasn't dropped yet. We're talking to Joe Nasira. He's a, columnist, a business columnist for the New York Times. He also wrote, All the Devils Are Here, The Hidden History of the Financial Crisis. Joe, so that goes to my final uh, question. I think that this is headed for an obvious next collapse. And, and the reason for that is the heart of it ne didn't really get changed. So you still can do the derivatives trading. You still don't have effective uh, you know, uh, limits on leverage. And you go down the road of the uh, checklist of all the things that got us in this mess, and hardly any of them have been changed. So even if they're not doing things wrong now, which I'm not convinced of, even if they're financially healthy now, which I'm definitely not convinced of because of what you mentioned, the bad loans are still in the bank's books. A lot of them are, although some got shifted off to the Fed. Um, even if all that stuff was great, if you don't fix the system, it's bound to blow up again. They'll come up with a new financial innovation. They'll come up with a new derivative in a new field, and they'll take the same risk because they have the profit motive to take that risk because they don't suffer the downside. They only get the upside as executives in these companies. So well, you know, once again, you're making a great speech that it's hard to disagree with. Um, uh, I, I look at it, it, I think you're basically right, that, not, not that, that, that we're, 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 we could, if circumstances, uh, uh, we could very well um, get this, get, you know, have another collapse. I hope we don't. I, I, I kind of don't think we will. But uh, what scares me, which is a little different from what scares you, is what's going on in Europe. And what's going on in Europe is that one country, it's, it's just like what happened in 2008 here, where, you know, first Bayer's in trouble, then Lehman's in trouble, then Morgan's in trouble, then Goldman's in trouble. Over there, it's like, you know, first Greece is in trouble, then Ireland's in trouble, then Spain's in trouble, then Italy's in trouble. And, and you know, you can't have one country after another, uh, you know, uh, having the whole the, the market afraid that they're about to collapse in, in a heap of debt and, and not worry that that's going to leapfrog over the Atlantic and hit us because our systems are so intertwined. So, so when I think about the pos prospect of something bad happening, that's kind of how I envision it. Okay. And you know what? I decided I'm going to go at one more question here because I, I agree with you completely. And I, and I think that... Uh, those countries are facing the same problems we did because they have the ultimately the root problem, which is we've let the banks run amok, uh, whether it's in Ireland or it's here or it's in Greece. And when you take that kind of risk, it's a guarantee you're going to blow up. It's a guarantee. You'll blow up in Europe, you'll blow up in America, and then it'll be global. There's no, I, I think, logically speaking, there doesn't seem to be any way of being able to stop it. Uh, I, I hope you're wrong. <laughs> well, I hope I'm wrong, too, and I say it every day. But yeah. no one has shown me how I would be wrong. But, yeah. uh, but so what I wanted to ask you, uh, Joe, is that, so look, the Fed did this $1.1 trillion of basically toxic mortgages that they bought. Right. And, and that's a, and I'm never really quite, I mean, I know that that's egregious. I know the banks got to dump a trillion dollars into the Fed that, of junk, mm -hmm. right? Which is unbelievable, blows your mind. But here's the part that, that's a little hard to comprehend. So when that stuff turns out to be not worth $1.1 trillion, but worth a hell of a lot less, mm -hmm. what happens to the Fed? Well, I mean, the Fed, well, the Fed's not buying them at par. I mean, the Fed, what, what happens to the Fed is, <laughs> you know, hopefully it, it holds it on its balance sheet, and, um, you know, they hope, they hope that the securities get some of their value back, which in many cases they do, they get some of them back, and, you know, the Fed will eventually take the hit if it comes to that. Um, um, but the Fed has a very strong balance sheet. And, and, and in, in most cases, uh, what the Fed actually did was lend money 
uh, which, for which it has often been paid back. I mean, I don't think the Fed situation is as dire as you're making it out to be, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but I see that's, again, I, I, I want to understand it better. So I don't, I don't even understand the concept of the Fed having securities and losing money on the securities. What does it even mean when the Fed loses money? They bought it at $1.1 trillion. What if it turns out it's only worth $600 billion? So well, then the Fed has to take that hit on its balance sheet. Okay, and then what happens? Then it takes a hit on the balance sheet. I mean, then it's a loss for the federal. It's a loss for the for the United States government. So then, does the Treasury have to come in and go? Here's five hundred billion dollars, or they printed the money anyway. What difference does it make? It just I devalues tell the you, dollar. You know what? You know what? I have never thought about this before in my entire life, and now you have me thinking about it. And I'm going to pick up the phone tomorrow and find out the answer. So we may have to revisit this next week. Well, I love that. Okay, that's great. <laughs> uh, Joe, it's, it's been a great conversation. I, we'd love to have you back on. And, and please, you know, let us know if you find out, because I'm incredibly curious what happens there. I, I am, too. I, I, uh, I actually appreciate the question, because I never thought about it before. All right, fantastic. Look, it's a great book, guys. It's called All the Devils Are Here, The Hidden History of the Financial Crisis. Joe Nasiris from The New York Times. Thanks so much for joining us, Joe. Thank you very much for having me.